Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to the next session of the Probabilistic Machine Learning Reading Group. Tonight's presenter is Anton, who's generously presented several times so far. And we're going to be doing um, studying, going over uh, dimensionality reduction. So um, Anton, whenever you want to get started. Uh, Hello, everybody. I just wanted to um, say a few words about um, my country because I'm from Russia. And uh, I'm very ashamed that my country now bombs my friends in Ukraine. Of course, we have a lot of friends and um, many people also have relatives because it's just the um, adjacent country. And uh, I don't understand and don't find any explanation for this. Sorry about that. Yeah. It must be very hard. Um, I don't, I mean, personally, I'm obviously against what Russia is doing, but um, I don't attribute it to the, uh, the people who live in Russia. I mean, you know, it's, it's certainly not their fault. It's the, it's the government. You know. Yes, but you know, we have very strong propaganda and now also cut the information. Yeah. Like Facebook and uh, what's that? Um, TikTok is still there, but another I forget. Um, I have this application Instagram. Instagram is banned as well, and uh, yeah. so uh, unfortunately, people. Even my relatives, some relatives, don't believe that Russia is fighting. They believe that some national groups in Ukraine destroy their, their country. So it's a difficult information war yeah. as well. Yeah, they don't they don't see it as an invasion. They they, they see also it they, as also they don't want to believe in it because my yeah. gra grandparents they they lived during the world war ii and the, yeah. i think they just don't didn't don't want to believe that yeah. uh, it, it could happen yeah so they prefer to believe the official information mm. um, anyway um uh, yeah sorry that i used the time uh but no 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 thank you for your comments yeah i hope that's right. So, we to do. so let's start from um, uh, with today's topic. This chapter is around fifty pages, so it was difficult to. Um, prepare all the material for me, but I tried to do this. Um, so you applied a dimensionality reduction to the chapter. <laughs> I tried to, 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 to save the most of the variance there. <laughs> so, um, So let's, uh, today we will talk about um, principal component analysis, the probabilistic uh, generalization of principal component analysis, also about the mixture of uh, PCAs, about thousand quarters, um, and the, uh, uh, the manifold learning and word embedding. Half of material I will cover from the book. And uh, the first part I 
to prepare slides for this. So let's get started. Assume that we have uh, n capital data points, and each point lies in d capital dimensional space. So I am using the uh, the upper script for the representative of my data set, and I think I will not use the down script. But if we need to get the ice coordinate, then we can use the subscript. And we want to find the correspondence into lower dimension, the lower uh, case dimension space, which we will denote Z. And the first idea is, is to use linear um, transform. So we will try to approximate our data point X um, by this linear combination. Uh, this matrix W is d capital times d lowercase. When it's multiplied by z, which is lowercase d, we will get the capital dimensional vector. So we will reconstruct from lower dimensional vector z the higher dimensional vector x plus uh, mean. Later, we will assume that mean is zero which can be always done by uh, just subtracting um, the mean from our data set x1 and so on, xn. And how will, can we find these uh, parameters, w and mu? Again, uh, mu is not really important for now. We can... Um, minimize the reconstruction loss. So our x hat is the reconstruction. And um, here I missed the parenthesis. And um, this reconstruction should be close to the original data point x n. And um, for now, we use the mean square error loss function. In practice, um, it's possible to use also different uh, measurements of the proximity. So we want to minimize this mean square error and uh, uh, to find this weights W. I will uh, talk later about uh, the how it's done in practice, but for now I will just give the result. If we consider the empirical covariance matrix S um, the, and the calculate its it, its symmetric, so it has exactly the um, D uh, capital um, eigenvectors. So these eigenvectors will be the solution for this minimization problem. But we need to take not all um, D capital vectors, but we take the first D lowercase vectors corresponding to the greatest eigenvalues. So this, and here is the equation for, uh, for these eigenvectors. So this is the solution. But now let's talk about um, the 
understand and then uh, why it's called principal component analysis. For this, um, so as I said before, I will assume now uh, the mean is zero mean. It will just simplify um, some equations. And um, let's use um, singular value decomposition. So any matrix X in our case, I didn't say that, but in our case, um, matrix X contains the rows of our data points. So the first line will be the first data point, the second line, the second data point, and so on. The last row will be the end data point. And these points are D capital dimensional. So we um, factorize this matrix uh, using singular value decomposition. Um, just to remind you that this matrix is diagonal with um, uh, here I have uh, squared um, variance, so just with variances of um, Uh, or square roots of variances of um, this matrix X transpose times X. So there is the question. The question in the chat, sigma is covariance matrix. Um, uh, there is a, I, I abused a little bit notation. So uh, in the next line, yes, sigma is covariance uh, matrix. But um, in this case, uh, you know, covariance matrix is squared. But in first, in the first line, uh, it's rectangular. But um, the first d comp d capital components um, coincide with covariance matrix because then we have also zeros here to make it n times d. And uh, d and u are orthogonal matrices. That means that um, U transpose times U is identity matrix, and V transpose times V is also identity matrix. And um, now let's put this um, factorization into what is that X transpose X? X transpose X is the uh, Covariance matrix. Let's see it again. 
um, x minus mean of x, uh, if mean is zero, then it will be just x times x transposed. And if we don't use this factor one over n, then it will be exact, exactly x um, and also here my x is the column but if we put x in the row then we need to transpose to make the column so um, here x is exactly uh, x transpose time x is exactly the same as covariance uh, empirical covariance matrix, but without this multiple n. Uh, we can just multiply by n, and then we will get x and one x. Okay, and uh, now let's uh, put here our x. So x transposed will be v times sigma transpose times u transposed the first part and the second part is just our x as i mentioned before orthogonal matrix u times u transposed is just identity matrix so we have um, this uh, representation and um, and um, if we multiply this matrix by itself, we will get this um, eigenvalues squared. And dimension will be d times n times n times d. So the dimension will be exactly d, d times d. And now, um, it's interesting to note that this matrix is diagonal matrix. The first matrix is a squared matrix. Um, um, so the dimension dimension is here n times d. So this dimension will, will be d times n. So the then the same dimension as uh, th this diagonal matrix. And from linear algebra, we know that um, also, I will just remind you that uh, this uh, covariance matrix is symmetric. Uh, matrix. From linear algebra, we know that uh, if I want to um, change the basis and to get um, diagonal matrix from any uh, uh, symmetrical matrix, we should use the basis from eigenvectors. So V should be the matrix um, with eigenvectors as columns. And um, you know that eigenvectors are defined uh, up to the factor. So we will ask for the unit length of each eigenvector. Uh, if we denote these eigenvalues by Lambda, then we have uh, this equation for eigenvalues. And the uh, eigenvalues of sigma of the matrix sigma 
are the square root of lambda. And Q, I, I denoted the um, eigenvectors of this um, matrix X transpose X. Uh, you remember I started from matrix W. So let's go back to our uh, lower dimensional representation Z, uh, which was um, W transpose times X. So Z I or N was um, a vector w times x n. But if we apply this transformation to each vector, then we use matrix form. And compare it with um, this matrix x v. So X is U times Sigma times V transposed. If it's multiplied by V, then we have only U times Sigma. And if we want to calculate the norm of this matrix, U is orthogonal matrix. Orthogonal matrix just rotate our I rotate or um, mirrors our vector. So it doesn't change the length of the vector. And um, so the norm of these vectors will be exactly the sum of um, if it will be squared, the sum of eigenvalues lambda. And now um, we see that these two representations are very similar, but uh, except one uh, thing that this is d dimensional, but we want to get the lowercase dimensional vector. Um, so we just can take truncated, truncated um, matrix V instead of using all D capital eigen vectors, we can use the lowercase eigen vectors, and then we will get exactly what we want. So this is the general idea. And um, if we look at the, this fraction, the variance of Z to the variance of X, it's easier to see that the variance of X, as I mentioned before, is just the sum of eigenvalues, but here up to the D component and the lowercase and in the denominator up to the D capital, and it gives the fraction of variance explained by new representation Z lower case. Now, uh, let's move to another point of view on this. Um, and also I didn't uh, mention why it's called principal component analysis. So let's go to the, another point of view. Another point of view is that we, sorry, here should be X lowercase, just one vector um, from our data set. Uh, let's multiply I will draw again. Let's take a vector, arbitrary vector W 
for the first component, I denoted by one, for the second by two. And then we have a data point X. Um, if we take the dot product, the dot product will give us just, um, uh, I also need to mention that the length of this vector W should be unit. And then if we take the dot product, we will get the projection of our data point X onto this direction. And if we have um, many data points, then uh, we want, for example, if we had only points along this uh, perpendicular, the projection um, of all these points will be here and the variance will be just zero. Um, but we want to, to find the direction um, to represent our data, not just um, glue them into one point. So we want to find the direction which will maximize, maximize the variance of our points. And obviously in, in this particular example, the maximal direction the direction of the maximal variance will be this one. So the other um, point of view on the principal component analysis is to find the direction which will maximize the variance of our data. And this is how we can find the first uh, direction. The second direction will be um, find similar, um, but in the orthogonal su subspace to the first uh, direction. Now, why it's called principal component analysis? Um, ah. And also, uh, let's say, let's talk first about connection with the previous um, eigenvalues. You remember I mentioned that we choose the eigenvectors corresponding to the first greatest eigenvalues. So we take first D lowercase eigenvalue uh, squared actually because uh, we use matrix covariance, which is X transpose times X. And it's known else just as the, the change of the basis in which our covariance matrix S has diagonal form. What does it mean diagonal form? It means that <clears throat> our data points, uh, which I denoted by Z. So for example, in S was X transposed, X capital transposed times X. In new basis, it will be Z transposed <clears throat> times Z. And in new basis, it's diagonal. Um, it means that uh, data points will be uncorrelated. And if we can find the first direction with the largest variance, explained variance, it will correspond to the direction 
with the largest variance. Does it make sense? So here's this connection of these two approaches of the minimization of the error between uh, X and its representation as W times Z and the maximization of <clears throat> variance in one direction. And uh, if you remember that <clears throat> That full covariance matrix X capital times uh, transpose times X was the capital dimension. So um, we just take the directions uh, with greatest uh, variance. I hope. Uh, I could explain it a little bit now about what why it's called principal component. Why these directions are called principal components? Because if you remember the equation of ellipse, and you remember that this matrix is symmetrical, that means this this is an elliptic form so in two dimensional space the, the equation of ellipse has this form and if we draw it um, it can be also rotated but uh, let's assume that it's in the principal axis so the principal axis of the ellipse are defined by these numbers A and B. And the these directions which correspond to uh, these eigenvalues are called uh, principal components. Um, by analogy with principal axis of ellipse. So if you have any questions, feel free to answer. Now I'm going to, oh, actually, here is the link. Um, the slides will be posted. The link on two one and a half hour each lectures on the, penis, on the PCA, where you can find more details about this. But now let's look at the examples. Um, there is a book um, on machine learning and this book has um, github so, so this book is called I think hands on machine learning Yes, here it is hands on machine learning with scikit learn theories and TensorFlow. And um, I use um, their GitHub code just to illustrate uh, these ideas now. Sorry, my computer is a little a bit slow. <laughs>
So here is the first example. We have three dimensional data points and we project them in onto the two dimensional plane. And these vectors are these principal components. Or in other words, the new coordinate system where our covariance matrix has diagonal form and they, they are unit length vectors. And here is the two-dimensional representation. Because why actually we need the lower dimensional representation? Um, main applications are follows. The one is um, just illustration of higher dimensional data because we can represent only in two or three dimensional space visualize it. And the other one is to create new features, for example, for very long uh, data like um, genetic sequence with millions of uh, genes. And um, for example, we have just 100 people, then we have um, very few um, data points. So we have to reduce our feature space, then we can apply also dimensional detection. Uh, here is more complicated um, surface Swiss roll. Here it's unrolled. And on the left, it's not unrolled, it's just projection. Um, and here is a um, two dimensional example where you can see the eigenvectors, and we use only eigenvector with the larger variance, C1, for representation of our data. Ah, I didn't say any, nothing about the choice of this, the number of these components, but uh, you remember I provided this fraction of explained variance. So one way is to use this fraction. Um, and here is the plot of the, this explained variance. And usually people use so-called ELVA where the character of increasing is changing uh, dramatically. So here it's something around 60, 60, uh, components. So this is one way how to choose the um, principal components. And uh, also you can set your fresh hold here. It's like, I think 95%. It also will give you the number of uh, components that will explain your data. Here is the example for data compression. And so you can also later look at these uh, examples. Now let's uh, go to the generalization of this method because the book that we are reading is called probabilistic machine learning. Now let's talk about probabilistic principal component analysis. The probabilistic model is given by this again linear model. So we approximate our x by this linear combination w um, wz plus mu mean value plus noise, where the noise, as 
usual, as in uh, linear regression, for example, um, is a standard Gaussian, uh, has a standard Gaussian distribution. Then we can sample if we find these parameters w and mu, then we can sample z from this standard Gaussian distribution. And it will give us a point along this principal component centered at mu. And um, you see this point in red is shifted by this z which was sampled from standard Gaussian. But um, now we also need to understand the distribution of X. Um, Because um, one way is to assume that it also has Gaussian distribution with uh, identity matrix. But uh, usually people are using so called factor analysis, where um, the distribution of X is given by a model with a linear model with um, well, not the unique uh, uh, is is not um, the identity matrix, but diagonal matrix with covariance sigma. And the particular case of this factor analysis is probabilistic principal component analysis, where we assume that our uh, the probability of uh, X, our model, is a Gaussian distribution with linear mean and this diagonal covariance matrix. So in other words, it's conditional probability. Uh, sorry. It's conditional probability with uh, parameters theta. And these parameters are mean, uh, weights, and uh, sigma. Having this, uh, we can represent the joint probability as a product of P of X given Z times P of Z. The prior is standard Gaussian and our probability of our model is Gaussian as well. And if we, want to find marginal probability, it can be easily done. The formulas for marginal probability for Gaussian distributions can be found everywhere in the internet, for example, in Wikipedia. We will get the marginal probability given by formula five for our data X um, without um, Z, just given our parameters it will have the Gaussian distribution as well with mean mu and covariance matrix C given by uh, this formula six. So we defined completely the probabilistic model. Now um, the question arise, arises how to find these parameters, mu, w, and sigma. And the answer is to use um, or exact solution using 
the likelihood function and maximization of this likelihood function. So this is the likelihood function of the Gaussian distribution with parameters mu and c. And we can just take derivatives with respect to mu omega sigma and find out these formulas. These formulas are derived in this paper by Bishop about the probabilistic PCA. So I just uh, provided the result. And you can see that mean mu is the mean of data actually. And um, these weights are represented by matrix Q, which is the matrix composed of eigen unit eigenvalues of the covariance matrix as, as in the standard PCA. Then it's multiplied by an arbitrary mat matrix, um, orthogonal matrix, because <clears throat> we can rotate our principle, our axis. And here is the um, diagonal matrix with lambdas or sigma squared and without the noise of our model. Um, which uh, coincides with um, singular values um, in case uh, sigma is zero. Um, now, actually, I'm not correct because Um, the fact is that if we take uh, the vector x along the principal component, that then it will be multiplied by the um, single value. And then we will get the same result as in non-probabilistic case. Um, Uh, so how to compute? How to compute? Uh, not um, manually, but um, using iterative um, procedure. We can use expectation maximization algorithm. And um, I just will remind you that it consists of two steps expectation and maximization. In the first step, we um, define the probability um, posterior probability z given x, not posterior condition probability. And um, in this case, it can be calculated um, explicitly because we have Gaussian distribution. And on M step, we maximize the evidence lower boundary. Um, just to remind you that evidence lower boundary had this form. Um, it will, it's expectation, it's actually the sum over all data points Q multiplied by this logarithm. And if we sub, uh, subtract, um, represent logarithm of the fraction as the difference, then you can see that the denominator doesn't depend on parameters theta, and we can maximize only the first part. And if we maximize the first part, uh, which is written, uh, I think it's the next slide, sorry. Uh, 
and we will take the derivatives and um, solve these equations, we will find the, the formulas for to calculate new weights and new sigma. Again, these formulas can be found and derived in that paper by Bishop. And um, let's look how how it works. So I don't see. Um, For example, in this example, I used the mixture of principal component analysis, and you can see the data set is the cross of two um, two sets, and uh, I used the mixture of two principal component analysis and it could find out this um, representation. And also for Swiss roll, this is the result of mixture with, I don't remember, nine or seven classes, one, two, three, four, nine. And um, here is the example, later also <laughs> played with photos of how to compress the photo with principal component analysis, but it's not that I wanted to show you. Um, so here you can see how it works. In each um, PCA, it finds the linear subspace where, um, which maximizes the variance of our um, data set. So you can see the um, the lower dimensional representation, the blue lines, and uh, where z our lies. But using the probabilistic model, we can reconstruct our x uh, using probability x given z, which is standard normal, just you remember with mean w z plus mu and variance sigma. Um, so the advantage of probabilistic principal component analysis is that you can use it as generative model. You can generate digits, pictures, and so on. And let's go now on the generalization of this idea, which is called the variational autoencoder. So just to remind you, we had this uh, joint probability for uh, probabilistic principal component analysis. Now, what if instead of using linear function, we use nonlinear function? So let's, our mean will be an arbitrary nonlinear function, which will be represented by a neural network later. And our uh, variance is also nonlinear function of lower dimensional uh, representation Z. 
And for simplicity, this function sigma, this is matrix, uh, is um, assumed to be a diagonal. So we have D capital coordinates for mean and D capital numbers for this matrix sigma. In other words, we have two D capital functions, um, which can be modeled by a shallow neural network. And the, the parameters, the weights of this neural network, we will denote here by theta. And here is the um, figure of this model. On input, we have Z lower dimensional space. And in the output, we have two D capital numbers corresponding to the mean and variance. And using this mean and variance, then we can sample our point X from this normal distribution. And this is um, this part is called decoder when we get the original data from their low dimensional representation, the code. Now, how can we train this decoder? Again, we can use expectation maximization algorithm. But, but um, because our model now is a neural network, <clears throat> then we don't have explicit formulas. And we can use so-called mean field approximation when we uh, try to approximate our um, conditional probability z given x by some functions from, in this case, from normal distribution. And with some parameters m and s. And um, then if we write down our evidence lower boundary, you remember that um, difference. We will need to calculate these integrals and this sum. And um, so there are several problems. The first problem is to calculate the back propagation, the, the derivative of this loss function. And because we have here integrals and then we should also approximate these integrals. And the second problem is that we use the sums over all data points. So, uh, So we need um, to, um, for example, if we have our data set X, then uh, to find the probability of X given Z, we should use all the data points, which is also computationally expensive. And these two problems can be uh, approached by two um, two methods. 
so to minimize the number of this M and S, um, the amortized inference was proposed. I will talk about it later. And to calculate the gradient of this loss function, um, the so-called um, rep reparameterization trick uh, was introduced. So let's probably talk briefly about these two methods. Uh, <clears throat> here's the link to the paper where this variational encoder was introduced by Max Wering and Kingma. And they introduced uh, proposed so called amortized inference, where we use another neural network to predict parameters M and S for given data point X. So we don't, we will not use all the data points X, one and so on, X, N, but we will use the train and we will use later the neural network which for a given data point X will give us parameters M and S for um, the distribution I will remind you the distribution Q of Z. So this is the first idea. And the second idea how to calculate the gradient. There is no problem to calculate uh, gradient with respect to theta uh, because we can just use uh, approximation of integral with the sum and um, which is called Monte Carlo estimation. Um, also, there is no problem to calculate the gradient of uh, tail divergence, but there is one problem to calculate the gradient with respect to the phi, the second neural network, which we used to encode our data. Um, so let's look at the first term closely, closer. So this is the first term expectation uh, with respect to Z of our uh, conditional probability. And uh, let's do the change of variables introduce variable epsilon um, with standard distribution and um, our Z will reparameterize, that's why it's called reparameterization with uh, mu plus the variance times this epsilon. And uh, we will get exactly, uh, I should use M and S here, I'm sorry. We will get exactly the same um, distribution that our Z has, and it's normal. And uh, then, this expectation can be, the problem was that you remember that this Q depended on uh, phi, but after reparameterization, this um, new distribution will not depend on phi. 
and we can then use the Monte Carlo estimation. Let's uh, look why uh, we can use this change of variable. It uh, goes from so-called Lotus theorem, the law of un un unconscious statistician. You can Google and uh, Wikipedia gives you this uh, name. Actually, it's just the uh, theorem for change of variables. If we have uh, a random variable of x and y is the function of x, but we don't know the distribution of y, and we know only the distribution of x, still we can calculate the expectation of y. And this expectation will be given by this integral uh, or sum in case of discrete distribution of this product function of x or y times the probability density of x uh, dx. Let's look how it works in our example of the Gaussian distribution. Here is the explicit formula for this uh, distribution, the standard, uh, not standard, but uh, the usual Gaussian distribution with parameters mu and sigma. We introduce the standard distribution epsilon and it's now we do this reparameterization. We use function, the linear function of epsilon. And you can see easily that epsilon equals to z minus mu divided by sigma. Now, if we look at the exponent, we will see that it's exactly epsilon squared over two. So we can use um, this standard distribution. And um, instead of writing Q here, we can write the standard distribution um, there is just one factor sigma, but if we use the d epsilon, it will be exactly dz over sigma. So this is an example how we can avoid the problem with um, integral of function of phi times fun, another function log of phi. And uh, to get the integral just of one function of phi and then apply Monte Carlo estimation. So this is the idea of the variational autoencoder. And I think you saw many applications, how can we sample, for example, digits, on the means data from the standard uh, Gaussian distribution. And they will have different angles and different shapes, but still um, it's close to to the desired um, desired a digit and um, so it's just continuous change in the latent space. Now um, here are the uh, links on the all this um, information about PCA, probabilistic PCA, and PCA. Now I will open the book and we will cover the rest of the chapter. Um,
Um, Anton, just so you know, you have about uh, 15 minutes. Left. Yeah, I, I will go just for the textbook quickly, just. Okay, great. Um, to finish out this chapter. Uh, dimension monetary reduction. Because I didn't mention a lot of stuff here. <clears throat> okay, I didn't mention out encoders, the noise and out encoders, um, and um, contractified out encoders. Um, I just will say that if in variational out encoder, we will take this uh, Q as um, uh, Dirac function, uh, then it will, um, re will reduce to the standard autoencoder. The noise and autoencoder um, is the following. So when we train our data on the uh, when, when, when we train our neural network on the data with noise, we add noise um, manually. And um, our loss function uh, takes the data without noise. Then our neural network learns to um, remove the noise. So th that's, that's why it's called the noise and out encoder. Contractive out encoder is more complicated. Um, and now it's a very hot topic. It's related to diffusion models. Um, so it's, it tries to learn, as you can see in this picture, the areas with higher density and so it learns the reactor field of our data. <clears throat> so let's go move ahead. Manifold learning. Manifold learning is when we want, for example, this Swiss roll to unroll into two-dimensional space, as you can see. There are different, a huge amount of algorithms. So multidimensional scaling and the um, most popular isomap, and uh, which is using the information about the K neighbors. And the kernel PCA, and also local linear embedding. In this case, we try um, the, uh, this uh, loss function focuses only on the nearest points and its closeness to, to K means actually. And um, Again, in that um, GitHub example, uh, where was it? Um, um, I lost the page. Um, <clears throat> in this uh, GitHub that I mentioned earlier. 
with examples, there are examples of all these algorithms. Let me just take a quick look. <clears throat> uh, kernel PCA. Uh, here is the local linear embedding for Swiss roll and um, this um, minimal distance, something like this, and as a map. So you can take a look um, on the implementation of this here. Let's move ahead. So the idea there is the most popular probably now algorithm is TSNE. T uh, goes from T distribution, student distribution, SNE, stochastic neighbor embedding. Um, I just wanted to mention here that it learns the probability density of our data set X. And then it tries to find the probability density in lower dimensional Z. And um, one comment here that I wanted to, to make is that they say that they use Kullback Leibler divergence to minimize the distance between these two probabilities. But the Kullback Leibler divergence is defined on the same probabilistic space. In this case, we have different probabilistic space. Here is the space of X and here is the X of Z. So uh, it's not actually correct to call it uh, or divergence, of course, we can use any metrics, any, any distances. Just I wanted to mention that by definition, it, the probability should be defined on the same space, probability space. And I think it's almost, ah, word embedding. Another application of um, dimensionality reduction is broad embedding. It's the last page of this book um, that um, when we try, when we have a, a large, a huge corpus of words and we want to um, find an embedding for the word, usually it's um, 220. Uh, uh, 28, if I remember correctly. So, uh, because if, if we, uh, the previous approach was to use one hot encoder, but one hot encoder would uh, like have millions, if there are millions of rods, there would be millions of dimensions. So they, um, for small corpus, it's a good approach, but for a large corpus, there are um, two approaches which are called latent, latent semantic analysis. Um, they use shallow neural networks, which uh, find the lower dimensional representation for each word. So this is the idea. The uh, word, these models are called work to work and there are two models, Sibu and uh, Skibram. So I will not, I don't have time to talk about uh, this, but just from this picture, I can give you an idea that the first looks at the middle word. For example, for five words, it looks in the middle world. The other model contrary for a given world looks at the neighbors. So 
example, this is the idea of these two models. And uh, let's finish the stop here for today. I hope you got an idea of this chapter. Yes, thank you very much for um, an excellent presentation. Um, um, and thanks again for going through all the material. I know it was a, a very long chapter, um, but um, your presentations are always very, uh, um, are always excellent. So. It's nice to have someone who understands the material um, presenting it. So thank you again. And um, I guess we'll see you next week for a uh, cluster. Yeah. And good luck with everything that's that's going on yeah. in, in your country. I know it's a, it's a really difficult time. Um, and thank you for pre presenting and, and participating in the, in the midst of all the chaos. So. Yeah, I uh, I just want to mention that I'm not in Russia now and oh, that's United right. States, so yeah. um, I feel like more uh, safe here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> okay. Well, thank yeah. you, everybody, um, and we'll see you again uh, next week. So have a great uh, week. Uh, yeah, have a good night, everybody.